will be continuing with our next talk and our next speaker. And the speaker is Chandler Karuth. Chandler leads the C++ platform team and LLVM team at Google, so straight from California. He is also an active contributor to the LLVM and Clang open source projects and speaks at various C++ events where he tries to help spread knowledge about C++ compilers, tools, and optimization. Previously, he worked on several components of Google's distributed build system. Let's have a big hand for Chandler Karuth and his making C++ easier, faster, and safer with tools part one. Chandler. Thank you very much. My name is Chandler Carruth. I work at Google. I work on LLVM. I work on Clang. I'm a complete compiler nerd. And today I'm going to present to you absolutely nothing that I directly work on, which I do apologize for. Um, this stuff is stuff that lots of folks on my team have worked on, lots of stuff in the open source project that I think is really awesome and exciting. And the reason I think this is awesome and exciting is because I write a lot of C++ code. And I want it to be easier. I want to write it faster. And I want the result to be safer. Now, some people might be wondering, like, who, who here thinks C++ is already easy, fast, and safe? Anybody? It's okay, you can put your hand up. I don't mind, I don't mind being wrong. So, so before we get into making something easier and faster and safer, we have to figure out what problem we're trying to solve. I always like to know what problem I'm here to solve. So why is C++ hard? Anyone think, that, who here thinks C++ is hard? Everyone with your hand down is not paying attention, come on. A lot of people think that C++ is challenging because you know, it, 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 it's, you know, it's a very complicated language, because it's, it's got weird syntax, or because, I don't know. But I actually have some very specific things that I think drive up the challenge we face with C++. Number one, we have to deal with some history. We have to deal with the legacy of C code. Most of my least favorite, I know that's a, a confusing phrase, most of my least favorite C++ features come from C. And they even, in a lot of cases, make sense in C, but they don't make sense in C++, and they make the language harder to work with. We also have to deal with a lot of old C++ code, which may not work the way we want. It may not use the idioms that we're used to. It can be much more challenging to work with than kind of modern code, than code we actually would like to work with. Uh, there's also this issue of subtlety, all right? And, and this is a quote from Bjarne that, that C++ has become a little bit too expert friendly, right? It's become quite challenging to write boring C++ code in some cases. And, and that also kind of feeds the, the challenge of this language. But all of this comes down to complexity, whether it's complexity from the history of C, whether it's complexity from poorly written or poorly documented or, or just plain crazy C++ code, or whether it's the fact that we have, you know, tremendous amounts of, of expert C++ code doing very subtle and challenging things, we have complexity. Ultimately, complexity is kind of the way we solve hard problems. Unfortunately, it makes our code hard to work with, okay? So we need to deal with this. And we need to deal with it using something very powerful, because complexity is incredibly expensive. This is a quote from Rob Pike, that the cost of complexity is exponential because each time you add complexity into a system, it interacts with every other component of the system. They, they aren't separable. They aren't independent pieces. And so as you make things more complex, you actually make the things that were already there more complex. It's very, very frightening, okay? And so, so we need to work very hard to drive simplicity into the language. All right, now, sorry. The other thing I do want to point out is that I, I actually am, am proud to say I, I try, I strive to be an actual software engineer. What I mean by that is that I strive to apply engineering principles to software. And so I love looking at, at kind of the definition of, of software engineering, right? This is, this is off of some terrible website like Wikipedia, right? Uh, but in particular, the definition of the engineering component, right? Taking a systematic, disciplined, quantifiable approach to, to the development, operation, and, and management of software. This is amazing, right? This is, this is amazing because this means we can't just kind of wing it, right? We can't just try. We actually have to have a reason why all this works, all right? And then we have the reality of software engineering. And this starts to speak to the problem that I think we all face when developing large, complex software systems. 
We set out to kind of engineer the correctness of our software, to really focus on the complexities of the domain, of the problem we're trying to solve. We set out to try and do all of these really important things. And we ended up spending our time doing these really boring things. Right? Refactoring things, just you know, applying layers. This is not what we came in here thinking was going to be hard. But this is what we're actually doing with most of our time. We're not actually spending our time on the complexity. And that's exciting to me, because these are things I can help with, okay? So when we are looking for simplicity, right, we can actually try and help that with tooling, right? We can, we can try and build abstractions, right, with simple interfaces around complex functionality. Uh, and we can try and remember that clever is not really a complementary term. Have, have anyone here heard this phrase, that clever is not a complement? Okay? You need to embed this in your skull. This is incredibly, this, is, this may be the most important thing from my talk. Clever is not a compliment. All right, I know all of this, but that takes time and energy, right? Not doing clever things, doing simple things, building abstractions, refactoring things, layering things, applying the discipline. All of this takes time and energy, all right? And I don't know, how many folks here are lazy? Every single hand goes up, right? How many folks here want to feel like this bear, right? Just like, oh, come on, do I, have to, do I have to do all this work? It's no fun. All right, so how do we fix this? Well, I, I, have, I have one particular idea how to fix this, okay? We build a tool, possibly an overly elaborate and complex tool, but we build a tool to kind of automate all of these things that give us productivity. That way we can be lazy while getting things done. This is fantastic, right? This is where it all comes together. All right, so we're going to automate and we're going to accelerate these kind of manual time-consuming tasks. And that's going to allow us to focus on, on driving simple solutions to complex problems. It's going to allow us to focus on the harder parts of software engineering rather than wasting our time on the mechanics of applying the software engineering discipline to our to our day-to-day -day jobs. Now, unfortunately, building tools for C++ turns out to be really hard. Okay, hard like like you know, there's this giant programming language dragon thing breathing fire onto you. Kind of hard. It's really hard to build tools for C++. But there was there's this great thing that happened about five years ago. Uh, the LLVM open source project added a C++ front end to to its scope. Okay, and and as part of that, we started to build up a toolkit of really amazing compiler technology to try and let us build tools for C++, right? It started, you know, uh, well over 10 years ago now with LLVM, but then five years ago we got Clang, right? And we got more and more pieces of compiler infrastructure. Everything from a C++ compiler to a linker to a debugger, right? It's everything you would want to build tools for writing software, okay? It's all, it's the whole thing. And that's really, really exciting because now, now we have the technology, we can start building interesting tools. So any guesses what the very first C++ tool that we should build is? Any guesses at all? Uh, okay, someone who hasn't actually sat in on one of my talks before, because I hear you down at the front with the plant. No one? The compiler. Compiler's always the very first tool. How many folks here have taken a compiler class? Not so many. Anyone here who took a compiler class with this compiler textbook? All right, I love this compiler textbook. And, and I mean that in kind of a nostalgic and it's actually a terrible compiler textbook kind of way. It's a wonderful textbook, it's a bit dated though. Okay, so Clang and Elevium is a production C++ 14 compiler. Uh, it, we are actively working on C++ 17 features. There's a race to see who gets there first. I don't think the race is between us working on the compiler and some other group working on the compiler. The real race is between the people working on compilers and the crazy people on the standards committee, like myself and Michael Wong, who are trying to standardize the thing. Compiler vendors are trying to get it implemented first. Standards people are trying to standardize it first. We'll see who wins. But stay tuned. I think you'll have a great C++ 17 compiler set as well. So it generates high quality code, does it relatively quickly, but there's one aspect of Clang that I find really important as a tool for the programmer to remove a very you know, manual and time consuming task, and that are compiler, those are compiler diagnostics. Anybody here seen the house television show from the US? You should go check it out, it's totally fun. 
And then this, this slide will make slightly more sense. Okay, now we're gonna move on to live demo, which may result in something like that, but here's hoping. All right, so the very first thing we're gonna look at here are some code examples. Now when I show you guys code, all right, we're, we're gonna play a fun game. This game is that as I show you code that's full of bugs, you're gonna try and like raise your, 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 your hand and, and, and you know, let me know if you spotted the bug in the code. Okay, so, so we want to raise your hand once you spotted the bug in the code. This slide is apparently very terrifying, but that's okay. Or hard to read from the very back. I can make this bigger if anyone wants it bigger, shout out. All right, so let's look at this code. So we have some code here. Um, oh my goodness, that's way too far up. We can, we can fix this. All right, so we've got some code here, right? It's doing a bunch of things. It's not terribly interesting, but like there's a compiler bug here. How many folks have spotted the bug? Anyone yet? I mean, it's kind of, okay, we've got like one or two people, maybe. It's annoying to see this bug, okay? This is really an annoying bug for just a human to stare at this and, and, and see, right? But fortunately, that, that's why we have compilers. So I can, I can, you know, take my compiler and I can run it over this. And it'll tell me something fairly useful, right? It tells me that, hey, you have an array, right, with, with this bad compile, you know, this bad array bound over here. It even tells me how it got instantiated, right? Each way, all the way down, and I can see the 42 down here, right? Pretty nice. Even GCC does this though, right? This is old stuff. How many folks see, how many folks use Clang and are used to this kind of error message? No, that's not nearly enough people. How many folks use GCC and are used to this kind of error message? Okay, that's slightly more. We gotta get more, we gotta get you guys more compilers and newer compilers. Okay, so this, this is amazing though. Right? This tells you how templates go wrong. You don't have to guess. You don't have to see this kind of action at a distance. It walks you through every layer of the template instantiation showing you how it went wrong. All right, let's, let's try, let's try a, another example here. I have a few more examples. All right, so this one, this one of course, deals with everybody's least favorite construct, macros. How many folks see this bug here? This one's a little easier to see, although it's still kind of annoying. We've got like a few, like here and there, we've got a few. Right, but it's still kind of hard. It's hard to see this because the bug isn't just readily apparent. You've got to trace through these different layers of code, right? But of course, if we hand this to a compiler, it, it just knocks us out of the park because it says, hey, look, you, you called an object type int. You, you can't apply a call operator to an int. And then it shows you how that happened, right? It shows you that, Hey, we wrote Y down here, and then we, we pushed it through a macro and pushed it through another macro. It tries to walk you through this. Make some sense? Now, a long time ago, we used to show you these macro kind of backtraces every single time you made an error inside of a macro. And this annoyed people a lot because they used things like assert, and, and it would cause lots of, of stuff in their error messages. And we, we fixed this in a really kind of nice way. So if I go and I change my code here to not actually have uh, this B, and I go and compile it again, you're gonna see something cool. We just stop you right at the error message. We say, like, no, right here, there's the error. There's nothing else you need to see. And the reason this is super nice is that we've recognized, hey, this error is fully contained in the argument to the macro, right? That, that token is already syn a syntax error. We can discard all of this macro nonsense. The user wrote it right there and it was already a bug before he ever ins like expanded any of these macros. Right, and this is some of the powerful stuff we can do inside of Clang with diagnostics. All right, tough crowd, okay. So let's try, let's try another kind of fun example here. All right, how many folks are seeing the bug in this code? I write this bug about I would say 10 times a day, give or take. How many folks see the bug? This one's not hidden, and yet it's so hard to see. Humans are really bad at seeing this kind of bug in code. Right, so, so it's okay, we've got, we've got our, com our, our handy compiler, it'll help us out. And so it tells us, hey, uh, you, you, you didn't spell this the right way, right? This initializer is spelled differently. Needs to have two capital letters. Right? I love typo correction. This saves me so many times. But typo correction on just a, a, you know, missing some capital letters is, isn't that awesome. We, we can do way better than that. 
So this is, this is another kind of classic mistake people make, right? So we've got some code at the top. You come down here, and when we compile it with Clang, it's going to tell us, hey, look, you actually got your, uh, your, your namespaces wrong, right? And, and, and you've misspelled stuff inside of the namespace. So the first thing it does is it recognizes, I didn't use enough namespace qualifiers. And it understands the structural nature of C++ to tell me, you just need a longer qualifier here. And then once it's done that, it goes a step further and it says, okay, okay, so I, I, I'm pretty sure you meant to say fizz colon colon bang, right, in this namespace, but once I do that, there's still a typo. And, and it separates the two concerns and says that, no, you also typoed the actual name down here, and so I'll give you the typo correction for that name. Okay, and this, this is just tremendously powerful. Uh, this caused me to stop constantly taking an interrupt when I was writing code to go and look up exactly how to spell that API, right? I just, I just write it because the compiler tells me when I get it wrong. I love, I love this feature. I'm, I'm also really bad at spelling, which may have something to do with how much I love this feature. All right, so last example here. Now, this, this one is, is actually an example from uh, uh, Alex Andrescu. He was, he was giving a very long presentation, and he was complaining about uh, some compiler error messages that you were going to see if you got variadic templates wrong in C++11. So, th so this is, is a crazy pattern of code, okay? We've got a two-template argument type, all right? And then we have variadic templates, and then we expand a variadic template parameter pack into this two-argument template, okay? But we do it with three template arguments, which isn't going to go very well. And to, to Clang's credit, it is not fooled by this at all. So when you compile this with Clang, well, if you tell it that you're compiling C++11, it is not fooled by this at all, and it tells you, hey, look, your pack expansion contains the wrong number of entries. We see that you're expanding into this template that only takes two parameters. We quickly go and just tell you about the, the, the mismatch. We don't try and expand things. We don't give you pages and pages of error messages. Anyone want to see what GCC does with this? I actually haven't checked. It accepts it, which is kind of bad. Yeah, that's really bad. Sorry, GCC. <laughs> All right, so, so it's an old version of GCC, to be fair. All right, so live demo. Folks happy with compilers? Silence. No, no, not just hands. Are you happy with the compiler? Are you still awake? A little. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some other tools. Um, so some other fun tools out here, not just the compiler. I love compilers, don't get me wrong, but there are other tools we should be thinking about. And I want to focus in, the, in this first part of the talk about around tools around authorship and modification of code. Like, how do you write code more efficiently, more effectively? How do we kind of optimize that? And, and in particular, this modification was a big concern that we had at Google uh, because we have a lot of code. I don't know if folks are aware of, of how much code Google has, but it's a lot of code, okay? We have hundreds of millions of lines of C++ code. We have it in a single monolithic repository. And we have a single unified build system that builds all of this code, and all of the code can depend across and on each other in any way that it wants. Okay, this is, this, is, this is a terrifying beast of a code base. And, and then we realized at one point that we can't change it anymore. Like if we want to change a low level component of our code base, we have to go and update not just hundreds of users, but hundreds of thousands of users that have encoded exactly the way that the code base used to work. And that's a bad idea, especially for low-level APIs. We need to be able to update them, to, to refactor them, to modernize them in any way. And we can't do that. We certainly can't do that with human manpower. We have to have something that helps us automate this process, okay? Um, and, and of course, the obvious way of doing this is that you build a bunch of tools that do refactorings, okay? And you make the code essentially look the way you want it to look. Um, and so, so a long time ago, I was, I was about this tall, I think. Um, th this picture resonates with me because I was about this tall. And I went out into my, my parents' uh, 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 you know, den and I got a toy for Christmas. I was really excited. It was a toy that looks a lot like this toy. Okay? It, was, it was a little board with different shaped holes in it and different shaped pegs. And I, I you know, immediately went and you know, was 
frustrated that I could not put the square peg through the round hole, found a giant hammer, and drove the square peg through the round hole. And that's pretty much exactly what we want to do to our C++ code, right? It's being recalcitrant. It's not doing what we want. We want to drive the square peg through the round hole. And this is known as refactoring, right? So, okay, let's, let's just do this. Let's go out and build Fowler's catalog of refactoring tools. The Java folks have been teaching us how this should work for years, right? The, like, how many folks here worked in Java? I know there are some of you. It's okay. You can, you can admit it. It's all okay. All right? This is a safe space. All right, so, so the Java programmers have been laughing at us C++ programmers because they're like, you don't even have an IDE. I mean, we don't even know how you, how you, you know, are you rubbing sticks together to make fire? What is this? And so, so let's go and correct some of that. And it didn't go as well as we'd hoped. Literally none of them worked. <laughs> Literally, we built a bunch of prototypes, none of them worked. And it took us a little bit of really kind of soul searching to understand why they didn't work. And I'm going to try and explain this. I can explain this in two just amazing slides. Here we go. All right, so this is, this is where we started. The first refactoring tool we ever wanted to come up with was this ability to migrate APIs for our code base. It's, it's just because of this, this legacy weight we have with our code base. So we have some bad function, right? And it's calling things, and we want to change it. So. We'll, we'll change it, right? We've written our magical refactoring tool. We can you know, insert a new argument, rename the function, create a local variable, set up the local variable, and create a scope for that local variable, right? I mean, first off, this is really hard. We had to know that we needed a scope. We had to know which scope to place the local variable into. This took, this took us a lot of engineering effort to even be able to do this. But we got it. We got to about this point. Now, does anyone see anything wrong with this code? Say what? The indentation's terrible, right? Like, so we sent out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of changes to you know, the kind of part of our code base. It was our little guinea pig to see what mechanical refactorings would look like. And they came, every single one of them came back for, with the reviewer saying, like, you cannot do this to my code. This is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. It's not going to happen. And so we'd essentially discovered this odd property, all right? So, so we're sitting here looking at like a scary property. We're like, okay, so manual refactoring kind of just goes up and to the right in all the wrong ways as the size of the code base gets larger, right? The time to change anything goes up. Really, really bad. But what we discovered was something else. Even if you get rid of this blue line with some crazy cool tooling, we still have this green line for refactoring. Right, refactoring is, it's refactoring, uh, reformatting is easier than refactoring, right? It, it's now a very, very mechanical change. But it still is going up and to the right. No matter what we do, this will eventually cross our threshold of what we can possibly do. So we have to be able to automate not just the refactoring, but also the reformatting of all of the code. All right, this is a really big challenge for us. And so we came to this soul-searching re-examination. What is really the most important tool to reduce programmer time? And it turns out, fixing white space. Okay, this is in fact the single most important tool we could possibly build for C++ refactoring and to, to automate stuff. I, I promise, it really is. And the reason is because, let's all admit it, your code is a beautiful, unique snowflake, okay? Like, like you love it. You, it. you crafted it over years. It's beautiful. And then, of course, you, know, you, you believe this, everyone, myself, I, we all believe this until we send our code out for review. How many folks here do code review? Good, I'm glad a lot of hands went up there. Okay, so, so you know, we send it out for code review. And when you send it out for code review, you get a very predictable response. Because it turns out that your code reviewer has a different idea of, of what a beautiful snowflake should look like than you do when it comes to your code, okay? But this isn't just, like, we're not just wasting one cycle of code review time here because I have never seen a code review about formatting that ended here. Oh, no, 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 no. It immediately escalated because, of course, we disagree about what the one true way to format anything is. All right? And this, this escalates rapidly, and it turns into a nightmare. This is, this is really bad. It cost us so much programming time that we weren't even aware of. We weren't even thinking about the time lost here. But all of this is because of formatting. And before we go on, I, I got I to gotta actually spend some time to explain why we also want to spend time 
formatting code well. Because this doesn't make a lot of sense to some people, all right? How many folks here think that it's really silly to waste our time formatting code in a very specific way? Yeah, so you got some folks in here who really think that. And yet, how many folks here will spend as much time as it takes to get it formatted the right way? And we have a bunch. So, so we've got to talk about this. All right, so, so here's the thing. We're trying to fix complexity. We have to think about how humans deal with this. Human beings handle complexity by recognizing patterns. If you talk to any uh, perceptual psychologist, they will tell you about this, right? We perceive patterns. We, we integrate those patterns into our brains. That is how we handle complexity, okay? Now, well-formatted code, for a lot of people, well-formatted code forms a very particular pattern that is very easily recognized, very easily integrated into what they're thinking. If you don't form those patterns, they don't recognize what your code does. Now they're thinking about two layers of complexity. One of them, a physical structural complexity of the code on the screen, because it's unfamiliar. The other one is the complexity of all the actual software they're dealing with. By just eliminating this first one, we actually make programmers more productive at dealing with the complexity of the software, okay? I also like to draw an analogy to Go. How many folks here have played Go? Few people? Should all go at least play with it. It's very educational. Um, if, if you play with Go, something anyone who plays Go will tell you is that you don't, you don't actually play Go the way you play chess. How many folks here play chess? Any form of chess? More people, okay. So when you're playing chess, you're thinking through the moves, right? You're figuring out what's going to happen, what the probabilities are, you're looking forward. Go players do some of that, but much less than you would expect because the, the explosion of state is just too large. They can't think through each of the moves they're going to see. Instead, they do something very different. What they do is they recognize patterns on the board. They recognize shapes, patterns, the ways that the stones kind of come together and what that means. All right? And that's exactly what programmers are doing when they're looking at code. You don't actually have time to read all of the code you read. Right? You skim it. You pattern recognize it. You just, you sweep, oh, oh, it's doing that. Okay, I'm not going to read that anymore, right? And this is why every time we can kind of surface those abstractions, we're better off. This is why Sean tells us to stop writing loops and start writing algorithms, because we've just gone from, you know, one pile of code that's token soup into a name, right? And that's a pattern, that's something we can integrate and we can think about at a higher level. Unfortunately, everyone who says that it's indented poorly is wrong. Because indenting is easy. If that was the problem, we would have solved it in five minutes. How many folks here use Emacs? Okay. Well, really? How, wait, hold on. How many folks here use Vim? Oh, I like this crowd. <laughs> After my own soul. Okay. So for the, for the poor souls using Emacs, they laughed at us when we first told them this because they're like, I've had formatting solved for years. I don't know what you people are doing over there. Emacs solves all my formatting problems, but it doesn't. It solves an indenting problem, and that wasn't the hard problem. Here's the hard question, and this question took us about two and a half years to answer. Where do you break the line? All right, this is essentially, and when you're familiar with tech, or LaTeX, right? This is, this is the problem of tech. How do you choose where to break lines? And this is what, what we actually need to do for, for formatting code. So, so let's go back to demo because I like demo. All right. So, get out of our previous bit of demo session here. So let's look at, at what it means to have a tool that can automatically format your code. How many folks here have heard of Clang format? A lot, okay. But not everybody, which is already a problem. Every single programmer who works on C++ should be using Clang format, and that is actually not an exaggeration. All right, so here is some code. Everybody like, like my code here? Let's, let's get you a little bit more room at the top. All right, everybody like this code? It's, it's ugly, it looks like real code, right? We've got like long names, we've got too many arguments with not enough information in them. This seems like real production code to me. All right, so, so <laughs> look, truth, okay? It, it, it can be painful. All right, so let, let's start changing this code in, in a very scientific way. So if I just go and I make this longer, right, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a problem for myself, like, ah, namely in typing. I, I promise this was live demo. I wasn't kidding, okay? 
So, so now we've got a problem because this, these are going to be too long, but I have a solution. All right, now, this is a little, this is a little fast. At the bottom, you're going to see this PYF thing followed by a really long path, and it goes away because I hit page down. Sorry. Let's try this again. Followed by a really long path that ends in clang format and then clang format dot py. This is a super low tech, super awesome editor integration. All right, all this little Python script does is it talks the Vim Python integration stuff. It goes and figures out where your cursor is, takes that line, hands it to a tool called clang format and reformats it. And clang format is really cool. It understands things that I think are hard to understand. For example, it kept this const right attached to that closed parenthesis which is really important in C++, right? You expect that const to be attached to the declaration. And, and it might make sense to break in between, but it knows that you shouldn't do that because it understands the language, which is really, really powerful. And now, if I go in and make this longer, right, it'll, it'll, just, it'll just keep handling this, so it has to be even longer, okay. Right, oh, hold on, too fast? Here, let's go back. So we go from this, to this. It's going to take a parameter, wrap it down, and then reflow the text around it. Okay? How many folks here have spent way too much of their lives doing that textual edit? I know I have. The first time I saw, oh my goodness, I spent so much of my life on this. Okay? This actually takes me a, ser a significant portion of time when I'm writing code. It may seem trivial, it may seem like silly, but that's the reality. This actually takes a lot of time, and it's time you can do anything else with in your life, really, besides you know, hitting space a whole bunch inside of an editor. And of course, it wouldn't be very good if we couldn't you know, take it back, but it, it can take it back, it can reflow things backwards and forwards, however you like. Make sense? And of course, this, this doesn't just work there, this also works down here. We can even do some really, really, really weird things. So let's, let's uh, I'm going to pull out something I prepared earlier. because it's just too slow to type. So it could even be really bad, for example. All right, this, this, is, this is really, really, really bad. Okay, and, and when we reflow it, it does amazing things. So it understands that, you know, these templates should be separated from the actual declaration. It tries to lay that out in a reasonable way, finds the return type, the name, and then forms a nice column of arguments on the right-hand side. Seem reasonable? And then we can even give it really hard problems, like uh, the, all these qualified names for this one. And we can reflow it, and it understands, okay, well, you've got a name that's this long, so I'll take a different strategy. And it, and it then picks an entirely different strategy, pulling the return type out into a separate line, but keeping it not part of the template argument list because it understands that that's confusing, right? And then it says, like, well, this, this, this ended too far over, so I'll pull, I'll pull the entire argument list onto a separate line, and I'll, I'll give it some extra indentation so it doesn't flow into other things, right? This is really, really fancy, okay? And this is, this is essentially all of the operations I'm doing here, this is what we're doing when we're doing refactorings. And, and this is why Clang Format is amazing, right? It's, it's carefully in doing this. Make sense? All right. So that's, that's cool and all, but it gets better. So how many folks have code that looks like this? How many folks have like ugly, nasty, platform-specific code that breaks your editor entirely. I mean, like, I've got, I get editor bugs all over this because it's just, it's so nasty to deal with. And so then, you know, I'm going to do the worst thing possible. I'm going to go and say, uh, this actually needs to be called foobar. Now, here comes the real magic trick. So when you format it, it formats both sides of the macro. Okay, so here, I'll do it again, right? It's going to actually format both sides of the macro. Oh. It'll format each one individually if I want. OK. But if I do it on the top level, because I changed the name and not the actual argument list, it'll format both of them at the same time. So it understands this, this selection operation in the macro space. I want to point out the really amazing part about this. Right? You, see, you see the red thing here. My editor can't keep track of this because I have unbalanced parentheses and unbalanced curlies. Okay? Clang format's not confused by that, though. 
It understands what's going on here, and it's actually allowing you to format even in the presence of very complicated preprocessor macros. All right, so you're getting a little impressed with Clang format. But let's, let's, let's get crazy. Okay, so now I've got some, some real, again, production quality code. I've got a macro inside of a switch. We're, we're, we're in good shape here. Okay, so, so this code is horrible, perhaps. I'm not advocating this code, but how many folks here have code that looks like this? Yeah, I, you guys are way too polite about the kind of horrible code you see. Or you don't see enough horrible code. Or too much. Okay, so, so then, then we come in and we say something silly. I mean, this, maybe this is silly, but you do something along the lines of this. All right, and now I've gone and I've added an extra set of braces. Now, this is gonna get kind of weird because I'm changing the necessary indentation of this whole region of code, but I have inside of this region of code a macro, right, which is kind of weird. So, so how does Clang Format deal with that nonsense? Well, okay, so you'll see that it doesn't actually move the macro at all. It understands that that middle part's a macro definition. It's formatted independently, right? And so it's just going to move the actual non-macro code backwards and forwards. It helps if I hit the right button, though. And so you'll also notice I keep having to highlight all the code that I'm going to format. This is actually a big feature of Clang Format. This is what makes it most useful to refactorings because it doesn't disturb the surrounding code, right? It goes out of its way to leave everything alone that it can, and it just does a very localized ref reformatting, which is really helpful. All right, so you guys, right, is folks somewhat impressed by Clang Format? All right, I'm going to blow your mind. This, this is what blew my mind with Clang Format. So, so I've got this, this assert message, and assert is itself a macro, right? But I've got a string literal inside of the assert macro, inside of a multi-line macro definition. And then, you know, because I'm crazy, I say like, I'm gonna type a bunch here. This is what I used to think, right? And I, I used to write really uh, pithy, uh, assert messages because, well, I don't want to format that. Like, seriously? But I can mash a button and it'll, it'll do it. Hold on, let's, let's, let's look at this again. Okay. So, so we've, got, we've got a string literal here. Hold on, hold on. We've got a string literal here. We're going to format it. It's going to reflow the string literal, recognizing how to do that with the string literal inside of the assert argument. And then it's going to like extend my macro multi-line definition with the, with the nice gutter of trailing slashes all lined up prettily for me, right? This is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is the kind of beautiful and unique snowflake I want in my code. Okay. So that's Clang Format. Everyone who is not using Clang Format, you should go use Clang Format. We've integrated it into every single editor under the sun. Seriously, I don't care what editor you're using, you can access Clang Format. It's got a great command line interface. We have Git hooks, we have subversion hooks, we even have perforce hooks, like you name it. We can, you can rig Clang Format into your workflow. It will save you so much time, seriously. Okay, so that's formatting, and, ch and, and now we need to look at some other things, because this, this essentially, oh, I skipped over. So, so you guys like formatting? Do you want more live demo? Okay, more live demo. So, so formatting's great. We figured out how to do formatting. But we also needed to do some other things, right? We wanted to start building refactoring tools that solved problems like this. Because we, we, we realized when we went to solve formatting that this wasn't just useful for these massive, large-scale refactorings. It was also useful because it took away this mundane, menial task that you wasted your life on, and it introduced this nice, regularized pattern of understandable, comprehensible code. So what else can we do to automate that? My favorite tool here, uh, is, is, or my tool, the tool that we built here is called Clang Tidy. It's related to Clang Format, as you might have guessed. And I'm going to show you one particular aspect of this tool today, because it is easily my favorite aspect of this tool. This is called uh, the Modernize Checks inside of Clang Tidy. Okay, so how many folks have seen terrible looking code like this? Right, we've got, we've got oh goodness, the top of this monitor is impossible to see. There we go. We've got, we've got a type in C++ here. And like 20 characters later, we went and named the exact same type again. It's completely redundant. I hate having to type this. My brain hates having to read this. And C++ gave us a really cool thing to try and fix this, OK? So C++ gave us this thing where we can actually go and use auto to kind of deduce these types. 
So in order to do that, we need a tool clang tidy, okay? And we're going to say, let's look at uh, this file. We're going to select a particular set of checks. And I'll talk a little bit more about the kind of checks we have here. Let's just select uh, the modernized checks. And we want to dash fix, because I'm lazy. I don't want to have to apply a fix, even if you tell me about it. I want this to apply the fix for me. All right. And I have to tell it how to compile my source code, because I don't have a build system wired up. But that's the only really interesting thing there. OK. So this says, hey, look, you should have used auto here instead of the letter S. And it says, by the way, I fixed that for you. And if I go and look at it, indeed. It now says auto, right? Cool, but it's kind of it's kind of little, right? It's, it's not that impressive. We can do better than this. Okay, let let me let me do better than this. I gotta do I gotta do something to impress you guys. You guys are being great. You're putting up with all of my live demo. All right, what about how many folks here have seen code with auto pointer? Who have seen the horrors of auto pointer? Only a few, you lucky souls. So this is this used to be the terrible stuff you would see everywhere in code, because like what else are you gonna do in C++ 98? And, and you know, but that's okay because because we have we have Clang Tidy now and we can just go in and fix that. So if we run Clang Tidy over this, it's gonna complain a whole lot. It's just gonna go down and complain all this stuff. We've got four fixes. It says, by the way, we, we fixed four fixes. Right? Excellent. And I can go and look at the code. Oh, that's so much better. Now we have unique pointer, right? And I understood how to do the unique pointer transition, all this stuff for you, right? Does anyone see anything kind of ugly about this though? Anyone? Anyone? Make unique. Why am I, I still have this new here? I hate that. Well, you see, Clang Tidy is really, really clever. So, so let's look at what we actually did here. So when we ran Clang Tidy, we told it how to compile our source code. That included that the standard was C++11, OK? And Clang Tidy's modernized. It's like, oh, OK, I know what features are available in C++11. Unfortunately, make unique isn't one of them. So I've given you the next best option in terms of idiomatic modern C++ code. But if I have you know, a nice modern C++14 compiler, I can run it, right? which, is, which is quite nice. And then when I look at this, there it goes, and we have make unique. right? So, that, so it even understands the different dialects. And as we keep adding more and more modern C++ features, we keep building more of these tools, and we get to actually keep incrementally modernizing our code with tools and robots rather than with kind of blood, sweat, and tears and manual typing at a keyboard, which really makes me happy. Right? This, this saves so much of my time. All right, so what else do we have? We have, we have more demo for you. Um, how many people hate null putter, nulls? Right. So this is like awesome, horrible C++ 98 code using zero for null, right? Notably, uh, lots of people found other things to be null, like false. They also found things like string literals that were not null and pointer. All these are terrible, right? But but you know, zero was expected to be the kind of the canonical null pointer. But in C++11, we got something much nicer than that. So, so we should be able to fix this up, right? We should be able to do better than that. Helps if you can type. So if you run Clang Tidy over this, it says, hey, look, use null putter, right? And of course, it, it, has, it has fixed the code for me already, right? OK, that, this, this is easy. We, we, need something, we need something harder. We need something more exciting. Um, let's, let's, let's do override. So we also got this cool thing. How many folks have like lots of dynamic type hierarchies like this, right? You've got virtual everywhere, right? How many folks have written the bug where you forgot to override a virtual method? And pretty much everybody, right? We all write this in, in, when we're writing code. And, and so C++11 gave us a nice facility to kind of use that by putting override everywhere. And in nice compilers, we even have warnings. If you start putting override in places and you forget it somewhere, we can say like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you actually missed it right here. Right? We can give you really helpful warnings about this. But in order to get to that point, you have to migrate all of your code. You have to modernize it. And that's a mechanical, boring, completely useless uh, thing for human beings to do. So instead, we have Clang Tidy go into it. You may be noticing a theme here. And so it runs over this. There we go. 
panicked for a moment. And you'll see that it's, it's actually pretty smart about this stuff. So it even understands when override wasn't appropriate. So this foo down here doesn't actually overload the foo up there. It doesn't override. It's a new declaration. And so it's correctly keeping virtual on the roots of all of the virtual methods in this type hierarchy, but switching to override for all the ones that are actually overriding something from their base class, right? And we rolled this out to all of our code base, and to, we've rolled this out to lots of open source projects. Every single open source project and every single project in our code base, we found bugs. We didn't even have to like try to debug it. We just ran it, and we looked at the results, and we're like, well, well there's a bug, and, and, there, and you know, there's a bug. It is awful. So, so I really like actually having this and being able to get to a clean slate here. But man, you guys are, are a hard crowd. Okay, so I have to, have to bring out the big guns. Okay, so range-based for loops. Now this, this code I hate, okay? We have an iterator, and we get the begin, and we check against the end, and then we increment it, and then we get the result out of it. It's, this should be simple code. Sean is telling, I can see the look from Sean. He's like, it should be an algorithm. But like, even if it's not an algorithm, it should at least be way more simple than this because this is ridiculous. We can do way better than this. Okay, so, so that's okay because Clang Tidy is here to help us yet again. So if we go and we do range four on this thing, run over it, it's gonna complain a lot at us because we have a normal for loop. If we open this up, Ta-da. Now I want you to look at what this did, because this wasn't, this wasn't that easy to pull off. We didn't have a name for the loop variable before. We had an iterator. So Clang Tidy has to go and look at your code and kind of figure out how to give you a sensible loop variable name, despite not having one to start with. And so it knows that you have a container. It's like, oh, hold on, hold on. Containers that you're looping over are often plural. And singular is often a really decent name for the thing you get out of the container that you're looping over. Okay, okay, I know how to handle this. And so it says, okay, since you're looping over numbers, I'll name the inner thing number. And I'll go and apply that. It turns out this very simple heuristic works fantastically. All right, it catches the overwhelming majority of cases. And for the rest of the cases, you can tell Clang Tidy what to do. You can just increment, they just give you a, a numbered like variable name. It can do whatever you want. But this actually catches a shocking number of the cases out there. It'll also look at other clever stuff to see if you assign like the dereferenced iterator to a variable with an existing name, and it'll just pull that up into the loop variable, right? It's really, really clever. Tries to automate all the, the hard manual cases here, okay? And, and give you something easy and beautiful like this. So this, this is pretty cool. And let's, let's try one more. This is probably the, this is probably the hat trick for, for modernizing code. All right, so we have a bunch of code in C++ 98 that looks like this, which is accepting a string, right? We, we passed by const reference everywhere in 98, but you know, we then would, you know, made a copy of it internally. And, and one of the things in C++ 11 brought to us was move semantics. But now all of your code is wrong, right? This isn't how you want to write idiomatic code to take advantage of move semantics. This forces a copy even when it doesn't need to. And so, uh, Clang Tidy's modernizer actually understands uh, basic value semantics in C++ 11 and forward. And so if you give it this file, it will actually kind of think about the API you're using and what you're doing internally with that, uh, with that uh, const reference argument and see that you're consuming it and be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're consuming it, sorry, if you're consuming it, then you don't actually want to take it by const reference. You want to accept it by value, right? try and capture any temporary that was already headed into that parameter, and then move it into place because you're going to keep a copy of it anyways. Essentially lift that copy up as high as you can on the chance you can eliminate it. And it turns out that in many cases you can. This is a fantastic optimization of your code, and it makes your code shorter and more readable, more idiomatic, with simpler patterns, right? It's, it's addressing all of my key points here. It's decreasing complexity, and it makes all of your code you know, easier, faster and safer. I love this. Okay. So that's that's Clang Modernize. Now, this is this is actually the Clang Tidy tool and it's running the modernize checks. That's not the only thing Clang Tidy can do. Okay? So if you actually just run Clang Tidy help. It has actually some some pretty good documentation here. I was I was I was impressed. 
All right, and so this is all the Clang Tidy documentation, and it has, like, it tries to walk you through, look, this is a tool aimed at developers, here's how you use it, here's how you integrate it into your workflow. It talks about how to configure the tool to automatically do these things, to, to like, set up a particular set of checks you want to run on your code for whatever rules or compilers or bases you actually have. It talks about how to actually, you know, look at the checks specifically. It even mentions something really cool um, further down, because we have these checks, and we have this weird syntax to them. And, and if we go further down, there's actually a, a flag, list checks, which lists all of the checks that you can look at. Well, that sounds really exciting to me. So just how big is this tool? Oh, and it even tells me, hold on, hold on. Yeah, it typo corrects your, your command line flags. I'm just saying. The, the, the folks who work on this tool are amazing. All right, so here are all of the checks that we have. So at the top, we see these Clang Analyzer checks. This is essentially a wrapper around Clang's static analyzer exposed through this kind of pluggable, configurable, Clang Tidy platform for turning on different checks and such. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, this isn't all of the checks. To what, what's the flag? Sorry, yeah. Uh, some of them are just disabled by default. Ah, and again, I typo it. You can see why I need typo correction from Clang so badly. There we go. That's more like it. Thank you. All right, so, so you can see that we have, we have static analyzer checks here, and, and a lot of them. These are all the different parts of the static analyzer. We also have crazy other stuff. For example, we have checks from CERT's security guidelines are implemented directly in Clang Tidy and available if you're working on something that requires CERT-based security checks. You can, imp you can get those here. Um, I, anyone here heard of the C++ core guidelines? Hopefully a few folks have heard of these. Um, so, so it was an effort by uh, Bjarne Strustrup and Herb Sutter and, and uh, some other folks to try and build up uh, common best practices and idioms for use within C++. And they recommend a bunch of kind of checks for what you should and shouldn't do. And we've started gathering a nice selection of checks here. Um, really, really nice set of stuff here. Now you're going to notice something else cool here. You're going to notice a bunch of Google things here, OK? Now these are all open source. I'm not, this isn't like some internal version of the tool. This is the same thing. I built this you know, earlier today from, from the open source project. This is nothing crazy here. We've open sourced, at Google, we've open sourced a lot of the kind of basic coding convention checks that we've found really, really help us and that we've built on this platform. And so you can go and find a bunch of these. We have some just for readability, some for, for you know, runtime stuff. And, and these are kind of like formatting checks, right? It's not that the code is necessarily 100% wrong. It's not that this is always, 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 always a bug, but this will make the code better. It'll become more idiomatic. It'll be a better fit in the code base. And the nice thing about the fact that we have kind of Google stuff here is we actually have a fairly pluggable framework that can handle this kind of fan out. And so if you work at a company that has checks that, that really should be enforced by a compiler, right, you can add them to Clang. And, and you can even contribute them to the open source project. And you can even then set up your configuration to kind of pick and choose the checks from whatever coding conventions you, you use and build them into a nice set of checks that you run before you commit your code. It's really, really, really nice. Um, lots more. There's a bunch of miscellaneous ones. I mean, there, there are so many. All of the modernized ones are listed here, right? And we have a whole bunch of great modernized checks. And this is a great place that we want to kind of keep growing as the language evolves so that we keep things modern. And then we also have some generic readability ones, right? In addition to kind of Google specific readability checks, we try and you know, recognize anything that has very broad applicability or broad interest from lots of different organizations, lift it up into this, right? And th these things do amazing stuff. I don't have time to demo every single one of these for you guys, but they're, they're, they're just amazing. I, I, I really encourage you to go and look at them. All right, so that's, that's all the checking, that's all the formatting stuff. So let's, let's actually go back to slides briefly here. With all of these tools, we've been able to really start changing APIs and changing our code base at scale at Google, right? Changing hundreds of millions of lines very, very effectively. We tend to write custom refactoring tools just to make one API transformation, right? Turn this signature into that other signature, fix up these semantic differences, right? But 
We need to go past that, right? That's not actually Fowler's catalog of refactoring tools. We actually haven't done what the Java programmers were making fun of us for like four years ago, okay? Which is a little bit sad. But we've leapfrogged Java in a lot of ways. Uh, we, we actually got out in front of a lot of problems with very large scale code bases that Java hadn't faced yet. And now the Java folks are building very analogous stuff to this. I don't know if you guys have followed it, but there, there's a great open source project uh, based on, on the exact same ideas that we've used in Clang, but combined with kind of the, the Java and the Open JDK. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with it, but it, I think they're doing a great job. But we do need to go and plug this gap in kind of basic refactorings. We've started to build a few of these kind of one-off tools that are doing kind of basic renaming of things. Um, but that's not really the right way to do this. We want something that's a lot like Clang Tidy, but instead of for kind of checking and kind of convention checking and seeing if the code's good or idiomatic, we want a directed tool, like make this change right here, right? And so we're building another toolbox. And we, so currently the plan is to call it Clang Refactor. Uh, this is just starting up. I'm really, really excited to see where this goes. And hopefully, you know, in, in, in a few years, I'll come back here and instead of just demoing beautiful editor integrated formatting, I'm going to also demonstrate beautiful editor integrated outlining and inlining and, you know, variable renaming and, and all the kinds of kind of classic refactorings that, that we like to have. Okay. So now you're writing Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of code. You're super productive. Any guesses what comes next? Segfaults. <laughs> right? Like, this is inevitably what comes next. We've made people super more productive, and now they write lots more code, but unfortunately, that just means they write lots more bugs. And so this is the topic of the whole second half of this talk, where we're going to go through, we're going to talk about all manner of ways to like squash bugs, to prevent bugs from getting into your code, all kinds of other things. But I wanna, I'm going to stop now, I think. We're, we've got plenty of time for Q&A. Um, I've been blazing through. You guys didn't interrupt me even once with a question. Um, and so I'm going to stop. I'm going to answer questions. I'm also happy. Like I have, I'm not kidding about live demo. See, it's, it's still there. I will happily like, like try anything you want with any of the live demo stuff that I did. Uh, so, so please, let's, let's do the Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> he deserves it. So as ever, would you like to wait uh, for the microphone to uh, arrive and do ask your question, please? Uh, how do you configure uh, what kind of formatting uh, is uh, expected for uh, the refactored code. Because there are, usually there are some options, but some projects have these really crazy ideas that are later on not movable. So, so, so the question is, uh, essentially, um, how do you deal with the fact that uh, Every project has its own formatting, right? Um, it evolves over time, right? How do you deal with picking what formatting to use when you send people refactoring? That's a great question. It's a complicated question. Uh, so the first thing we had to do, and this, this is actually a, a really uh, challenging aspect of designing Clang format in the beginning, is that Clang format has to be parameterized the same way Clang Tidy does. I, I didn't talk about it, but it has a great Great help, great documentation as well. And so Clang format accepts a style parameter, okay? And inside the style parameter, you can, you can select particular coding styles. For example, LLVM's coding style, Google's coding style, Chrome, Mozilla, Kernel, right? All manner of kind of typical coding styles. We've got built-in presets. But you can go a lot further than that. This, doesn't, this isn't the best way to see it. The, the web documentation's even better. But you can actually specify a very detailed key value based configuration file here, okay? And you can use that to customize fairly precisely how each of Clang Format's decisions are made. Um, we try to resist expanding the configuration space of the tool because the configuration space of the tool kind of works in a, in a product relationship with the uh, kinds of C++ refactoring or, or formatting decisions we have to make, right? If we have 400 different configuration knobs and we have to format 5,000 different syntactic constructs, we have to deal with the product of that in terms of, of the uh, test space, 
All right, and it makes validating Clang format almost impossible. Uh, Clang format is one of the hardest tools we have to validate that it works, and we actually have to validate Clang format more so than any other tool in the compiler's tool set because Clang format sees more broken code than anything else in our tool set. People send halfway written code to Clang format all the time. So, so that's the first set of things, and that allows us to essentially change the high-level target so that we don't, we, we're actually trying to format things the way a particular uh, code base wants to format them. But that doesn't help us with the issue of drift, of kind of organic divergence within a project, where people just, some parts of the project go one way, some parts of the project go a different way. We don't have a good solution in general for this. Uh, you essentially have to firmly establish that the project is formatted against a particular coding style, and preferably one that you can encode using this configuration form. And, and once you establish that, right, for at least some subtree, you, you document it, you, put the, uh, you can actually put this into a .clang format file and put that in your tree. And, and, and just like with Git and every other tool, if you run clang format on a source file, it'll walk up the tree, try and find the nearest enclosing formatting configuration and apply that within that tree, right? And, and past that, you have to just be firm, and you have to kind of buy into the idea that you want consistent formatting to a particular set of rules. There are, there are a handful of things that Clang Format will try and, and depart from that rule with. We'll try to automatically detect a couple of really silly things that vary in code and people get upset by, such as does the asterisk go on, like, attached to the type name or the variable name? Also, I can't help this. How many folks think that the asterisk, you know what I'm talking about? Here, I have a computer. We don't have to be, we don't have to be vague about this. This is, this is important research right here, okay? This is what matters in life. All right, so does the asterisk go there, right? Or does the asterisk go there? Okay, so I, I, don't, I do not admit a third option. <laughs> you can claim there's a third option all you want, but I have control over that laptop for now. <laughs> so how many folks here like the first option? Okay, how many folks here like the second option? That's why we have it guess. <laughs> it's 50-50, right? And so, so we have no way of predicting which way people want these asterisks to go, right? We just no way of predicting. And so what Clang does, or Clang format does, is it looks at your file, and if all the asterisks go left, we put it on left. If all of them go right, we put it on the right. We try to be consistent, right? Because that's what we want for, reform, for refactoring. We want consistency. So we do that as much as we can. We, we fail at some point, and, and we fall back on the principle of your code should be formatted according to the standard and we know that our formatting matches the standard even if it doesn't match your existing code. Uh, in practice, empirically, I can tell you that this drops the complaints from formatting-related problems in refactoring to under 1%. So, like, we also have data. Like, we've tracked this. Like, it got us below 1% of, of, of changes we mail out with refactorings actually get a complaint. Oh, but the formatting's all wrong. Still happens, but it's rare. Second question. How do you handle code full of DSLs that format badly with the Clang format? Okay, one more time for me. Code that is full of DSL, domain-specific language format, using some kind of magic operators like okay. streaming operators. So how, how do we format source code which is uh, using some domain-specific language embedded inside of C++'s operator overloading madness, right? So So... Ah, uh, we don't. So, so a good way to think about this is Clang format reserves the right to tell you not to write your code that way. If you're using a DSL that requires entirely novel formatting of your C++ code to be recognizable as a DSL, I'm going to posit it should not be embedded in C++. Okay? Write a front end for that language. Your life will be better. Everyone else's life will be better. The other thing to realize is that this doesn't actually come up. Uh, we formatted code using Boost Spirit. We formatted code using uh, Fusion and a few others. Uh, this actually does a fairly good job with most embedded DSLs. Uh, it, it's, it's rather rare that you actually break with particular conventions of, of operator overloading. For certain things, like shift left, like streaming, 
Uh, we have built-in idioms that we recognize, oh, okay, it looks like you're streaming, right? You're not using shift. And so we'll line up the stream operators and we'll try and make things pretty. Similarly, um, for, for uh, builder-style APIs and fluent-style APIs, we recognize that idiom and we try and line up the formatting accordingly. But, but it's limited to idioms that show up broadly, not to like one idiom. So uh, another problem besides different formatting in a, in a large code basis is also legacy code and untestable code. So do you think it would be possible to provide some means of making code more testable, like Java and C Sharp have extract interface, extract function, and so on? Yes. <laughs> that. Right. I mean, very literally, right? Uh, we, need, we need the refactoring tools to actually make those kinds of transformations. And this is the, the bucket in which we're building those precise tools. How uh, this Clank uh, refactor will handle uh, Lambda expression in, for example, uh, like a f uh, predicate? Like in a predicate, yeah, sure, absolutely. So, so the, the first thing to realize is that, that uh, in a lot of ways, Clang Refactor is going to, the refactoring tooling in Clang is built around Clang itself. And so it doesn't get confused about where, where your lambdas go or how they're used, right? It understands at a very precise level. And, and we actually do reasoning about things like lambda capture uh, when we're doing refactorings to understand whether we're making a breaking change or not. Uh, sorry. Is, that, is that getting to your question? No, no. I, mm, really, I, uh, I was meaning that uh, for, for formatting. For not, formatting. Not for, uh, for refactoring. Yeah. I'll go back to the fun thing I was typing. So this is actually something I worked with. Uh, well, I didn't work with. I can't take any credit for actually working with them on it. But that I actually argued with the Clang format authors about in order to get them to, to uh, you know, dot all of my precious I's and all of my precious T's. So if you imagine you have like code that looks like this, right? So this is doing some, some like algorithm. Make sense? So Clang Format understands that. All right, so, so here, I'm, I know I, I, I hit it almost too fast. So, so if I format this, right, it's going to recognize that I have a lambda, essentially, in the trailing position of a function call. And it assumes that's a continuation and not just a normal lambda. Remember, this is one of the common idioms that it recognizes and handles specially. And so when it sees a lambda in that last position, and it, it starts to assume some kind of uh, continuation passing style API, and it formats it almost like it was an if. Right, it formats it like a nested block, very much as if it were a continuation. I don't know if, you go, if folks have used Ruby or other, other languages that actually have explicit continuation passing, but they often have the blocks just follow the function call, and we format it in that way. And you can see this do interesting things. So, so one example is if I go and I add right, some other argument here, all of a sudden, Clang format stops. It's like, no, 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 that's not a, pre that's not a continuation anymore. Right? That's a lambda inside of an argument, and so it completely changes how it formats the code. All right? Hoists it up to line up with the arguments. It's just an argument now. It keeps some of this, though, because it also understands that it doesn't want to put lambdas onto single lines if, they, if they're going to have different statements in them. It can be very confusing if you don't understand the sequencing between two statements. Okay? And it gets better, though. Hold on. It gets, it gets even more fun. So then if I, if I remove this, um, it does recognize if you only have a single statement, then there's no ambiguity to pulling it onto a single line. It collapses it the whole way up, right? And so it understands kind of these semantic kind of concerns uh, with, with lambdas. And, and the other thing that I, I actually really like, it took us a little bit to get this right, but we also noticed stuff like if you have more than one lambda, then you probably don't have this uh, continuation passing thing. Now I'm going to find you know, one of the bugs that I filed against the Clang format and hasn't been implemented by the team yet. But no, it does. It works. So when you pass two lambdas, right, we don't know what, whether the last one's a continuation or not. We've lost that strong signal. And so we fall back on the generic lambda formatting of they're just arguments. We format them like any other argument. Does that make sense? Any other, any other like, examples I can put up here? Like I've got the laptop. What else do you want to see? A lambda inside of another lambda. You think this is going to like confuse it or something? Okay, fine. <laughs> Fair enough. 
All right, all right, all right. So, so what happens if we do, you know, something like this? Is this what you're thinking here? Like some horror monstrosity along the lines of this, which I'm not even going to try and format cleanly until I finish. Okay, so like that. It knows exactly what's going on. Right? There are two continuations here. It's fine. Right now, Clang some, has some really great diagnostics, like telling you to rename some variable, to add some type name. It points you directly the, to the place where you need to uh, apply some fix. But the, I think is that you then have to switch to your editor, fix it, and compile it back. And do you think that it would be a good idea to maybe make it more interactive? Uh, which is this, Clang itself? Yeah. OK. Um, so, so you're thinking. So, so you're thinking. Let me go back to one of my examples. I think I have an example that looks not too dissimilar to this. Um, yeah, like this guy, right? You're thinking this, you just want it to apply this directly. Yeah. Right? OK. So, so if I were to do something along the lines of, and oh, I'm not going to remember the name of the flag because, because you asked me live. No. Don't ever do that. What's it called? Dash fix? Maybe. It's not dash fix. There it is. So it could pass those flags if you want. Because it fixed it. Well, I'm surprised. Ha! <laughs> Sadly, I didn't just implement that feature, but excellent question. <laughs> okay, I've got a question. Uh, I've got a, pro a project that is quite huge, and uh, it uses CMake uh, to provide many uh, arguments uh, to compiler. Is it possible to do it easily with Clang format, for example? I uh, for crank, uh, crank tidy. I just want to provide all of uh, tools, all of uh, arguments to to crank tidy. Absolutely. So that's actually how crank tidy is built. So so um, inside. It, so, so this is where I built LLVM um, and Clang before before coming here. Okay, and and it's a CMake build. And there's an option in CMake that uh, causes CMake to produce this compile commands.json file. And if we look at it, you can see exactly what's going on here. Okay, we have a directory in which the compile took place, the full enormous name of the f like uh, uh, f set of arguments, and the particular file that was being compiled, and and the the. So if I go oh, no, so if I go back to my demo here, which is lost in a pile of directories. I even, like I knew you were going to ask this exact question, so I even prepared a little, um, oh, I got rid of it. I must have gotten rid of it. So you can, you can write one. But if you actually run Clang Tidy just by itself uh, on a file, uh, it actually it assumes that you had done this. Because uh, we actually expect the common cases that you have a build system you're integrating with. We don't expect you to pass command line flags on the command line. That, that is kind of crazy. But if you just like uh, do auto after dot cpp right um, it actually will complain if i run this because it'll say hey i didn't find a json compilation database right that's what i looked for so i had to run without flags i have no idea what i'm doing essentially right <laughs> and so it, this is actually the default mode and if you search online about clang tidy we have uh, tons of documentation about this compilation database you can produce them from cmake you can produce them from ninja directly um, and and uh, i think there is some interesting tools to produce it for a bunch of other build systems it's really boring right it's a super simple json database and we use that to pipe the command line flags from your build system into clang tidy so that you can just like quickly run it on all of your files no problem thanks Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, your great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, I love your Clank Tidy feature. Uh, however, I can imagine that uh, your some of their checks uh, have their side effects. And the first question is, do they? And the second question, if so, how do you deal with them? So, so to make sure I understand the question, 
I mean, first off, no, thank you guys for actually attending. That's way more awesome, just saying. Um, but, but the question is, how do, how do we handle Clang Tidy checks when they have side effects, like the, the changes they want to make have side effects? Okay, um, so this is tricky. To a certain extent, we can't handle that well. Uh, and we don't have a strong ability to kind of replay the compiler. And there are a bunch of Clang Tidy checks where they aren't incremental. Uh, imagine, imagine the modernized checks, which are switching you from auto pointer to unique pointer. If you apply half of those checks and not the other half, your code doesn't compile, right? So you can't kind of apply them in, in, in this incremental way and update your view of the code based on that. And so the thing we found most effective, even though it's a little surprising, is we actually just go through and apply as many of the fixes as we know how to, and we actually hand the result as kind of edit chunks to, to something that actually resolves all of these edits in a very textual way, much like uh, a merge conflict resolution in a version control system. Right? And we try and merge away identical edits that come from two different places, and we, we surface any conflicts where, where edits kind of overlap and try and explain what's happening. Uh, it, it, so far, this has actually worked the best for us. And again, we've tried this at small scales and at large scale, and it tends to work kind of surprisingly well. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't a more advanced or interesting way to do it, though. OK, it has to be a really good question, though. No pressure. Well, let's, let's assume we have a standard situation, so a very big repository of like uh, thousands of lines of code. And do you recommend to just use uh, those tools and to, to generate one monster commit and then push it to the review? What, what to do with such a thing? So, like everybody actually faced, I believe. I, I think there are essentially two two things you want to do with these kinds of tools, right? Step one is you want to kind of uh, introduce more rigid conformance with some of these uh, standards, right? Formatting, uh, checking, consistency, all those things. You want to kind of incrementally raise the bar. Uh, there, I suggest that you use kind of uh, whatever makes code review easier to determine how much to put into one commit versus multiple commits, right? If you can change one API at a time and that makes reviewers' e lives easier, you should. You should split it up as much as helps code reviewers. But that's because I find code review to be a much more time-intensive task, realistically. The second thing is, how do you then hold the line? Once you kind of establish these practices, how do you keep them up to date? And I think that that's very simple. You just want to apply it to every single patch. Look at a patch, you run the tools over the patch. If the tool is finding something that is in that patch, then it has to be fixed in that patch. Um, and that tends to work pretty well. The other thing is that that advice is terrible advice because you shouldn't trust what works well for some other team or some other project. Right? You should use these as starting points. You should try it out. You should talk to the team. You should figure out what's working well, what's making them more productive or less productive, and iterate from there. Right? Don't be rigid about this. That's one of the beauty of building these things as tools. They really are just tools. Right? You, can, you can reshape them and redesign them and slice them up into whatever works well for your group and your project. All right, and I think that's all the time. Thank you all. Okay, thanks very much. Chandler Carruth. Thank you, Chandler. And I'll tell you why I think Chandler deserves a second round of applause. I don't know if you've been watching this clock, but he was doing his talk between 2 and 3.20 a.m. his time. Chandler Carruth.